With each passing E3, VR come, becomes more and more of a bigger part of this scene. And of course, one of the biggest players in VR is Oculus VR. Joining me now, founder of Oculus, Palmer Lucky. Palmer, thank glad you to be for, here. Thank you for joining me on the stage. Thank you for bringing uh, your little guy here. That's right. Uh, so this is now. Uh, you guys had your press conference on Thursday. You showed this off. This is the sort of consumer form factor you're going to be That's bringing right. out next spring. This is almost identical to what people are going to be getting early next year. We're opening pre-orders later this year. We're showing off nine games on the show floor. We have about uh, 20 partners that we announced last week. We're going to be showing more of those as the year goes on. Uh, really excited to finally get this into the hands of a bunch of different people. Yeah, and you've got a big booth over here. A lot of people are getting to try it out. Uh, have you sort of, do you check in with people when they come out of it for the first time? Do you try to get some impressions of how they experience it? You know, that happens a lot, not so much at EV3 because I'm trapped up in our press room. And sure. almost all the press that we've talked to, they've tried virtual reality before. Uh -huh. But even though they've tried virtual reality before, a lot of people are coming out and saying, this is the good stuff. And it really is. It's a lot lighter. It's a lot more comfortable. We've improved mm -hmm. the displays, the optics, um, the audio. It's, it's, a, it's a really solid, complete package. Yeah, so much of the experience is obviously that immersion. And so having the thing on your head, not like be able to fade to the background, the physical reality of what you're wearing, what's enabling it, you want that to not be the story. Exactly, and that's different from a lot of technology where the story kind of is the tech and its core functionality. Mm -hmm. We want the Rift to be different than that. It's kind of like a conduit for content. It's transparent. Ideally, you wouldn't even know you're wearing the Rift. Obviously, you know, look at this. We're a long way off from that day. Yeah. You'll know when you're, someone's wearing it. <laughs> uh, but someday we want to get to the point where you don't. And so uh, we've designed it to be really comfortable, not try to make the design really understated. Yeah. Uh, we've used uh, plastic and textile composites to make it really light and adaptable to your face. Uh, we're shipping it with multiple facial interfaces for different types of faces, uh, mm -hmm. people who are going to wear glasses so that it fits over those well, uh, all to try and make it so that you don't remember you're wearing it. Now, have you sort of, when Nintendo came out the Wii, they would put a uh, notice up, says like, hey, maybe you want to take a break, because they realized that the Wii was a much more physical sure. endeavor. It was a different way of interacting with the game. Have you guys thought of any kind of like little ping notification just being like, uh, yo, it's been like seven hours. Maybe I mean, you need a timeout? <laughs> it, VR doesn't necessarily have to be a physical endeavor. I mean, you don't have to you know, wave your arms around and stand up and walk around. You, sure. There will be experiences that do that. But most of the games that we're showing are uh, games that are s built around seated use, so that you can mm -hmm. sit there and play for really long periods. Um, if people want to sit and play for a long time, I mean, let them do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now I played for like, it was either tw it was between twelve and sixteen hours in one sitting one time. At people a stretch. shouldn't generally do that, <laughs> but I did. I did do it one time. I just beat an entire game straight through. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, during the press conference last Thursday, you guys announced your sort of p partnership with Microsoft and bringing the controller to uh, packaging it with an Xbox One controller. I want to talk about the other input device you announced then. But first, what is it, you know, what kind of VR experiences do you think are best for the for the Xbox One controller and what which ones do you think would thrive with the other types of input? So the partnership with Microsoft gives us a few things. One is the Xbox controller. Yeah. The other is that we get to work with them on DirectX 12 optimizations and operating system level optimizations that make virtual reality perform better and uh, be a lot easier to use. So mm -hmm. we've been able to get under the hood with them and make a lot of improvements that make it easier to run high performance virtual reality games um, on your PC. Um, but the, for the controller itself, people have been developing virtual reality games over the last couple of years. And people have pr developers have proven you can make really good virtual reality content using game pads. Uh, in fact, most of the content that we're showing today it uses game pads. Uh -huh. uh, and even though people have had decades to figure out how to make great gamepad games, translating them over to VR has taken time. So one of the pieces of feedback that we got from developers all the time over the last couple of years, uh, like literally some of these games have been developed for over, over two years now, uh, and uh, they were saying, look, we want every person to be able to, who buys the Rift, to be able to play our game without being able, without having to buy additional hardware. And a gamepad is not a huge significant cost. It's something we can do to make our developers more successful and to make sure that there is a baseline reference for what a person is going to have to use. Um, but there's a lot of games that are always going to be optimal for gamepads. Uh, you know, one-handed controllers are great, but especially what if you're using analog sticks, using one analog stick against the hand that you're actually bracing, mm -hmm. uh, like trying to move the analog stick while bracing it with the hand that's actually moving it, um, it can be fatiguing to use for really long periods of time. So for a game like Eve Valkyrie, where it's a space dog fighting game, and you've got multiple analog sticks and a huge array of buttons that you need to do to activate different functions, 
uh, a gamepad is going to be one of the best ways to control. And play that, yeah. And you're actually seeing that in the like when the, the U.S. Army actually uses standard gamepads to control some of their military hardware. No they kidding. Don't, they don't do like they have the access to all kinds of other stuff. But the reality is that people have the muscle memory. They know how to use it. But most importantly, it has a lot of complex inputs on it that allow for complex game genres that require that type of input. And it's interesting to hear you talk about uh, sort of that controller because, you know, controllers as we know them now, yeah, years and years of study and Decades. design have gone into this. Uh, but so much of the Oculus design process is doing study and design in Way and bringing it together in ways that people have not been using yes. before. Because if you know, w that's really one of the things we have to do. Oculus is a company that lives and dies by virtual reality. If VR isn't successful, we die. Whereas mm -hmm. for a lot of these other companies, it's kind of a side project. So we have to dump a ton of money into getting it right ourselves because we can't afford to, to fall back. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we're showing at the show is Oculus Touch, which is uh, our new set of Six Degree of Freedom 3D controllers. Mm -hmm. It allows you to well, put them on and actually have a representation of your hands in virtual space, but not like Connect or uh, something where it's just tracking, you know, ghost, ghosty hands. Um, <laughs> we've designed it to actually be kind of a cross between traditional inputs and natural inputs. Mm -hmm. So it has an analog stick on it, it has buttons, but it has a ring on it so that it's balanced, uh, so that it doesn't feel like you're waving something around. It's balanced kind of around your hand. You're able to, uh, it's able to track your fingers using a matrix of, sen a matrix of sensors that are mounted throughout the device. Mm -hmm. So you can point at things, you can give a thumbs up, you can do other things with your fingers. Throw, the, throw up the horns. Uh, you can't do that right now. You can't track your pinkies just yet. Oh, I haven't um, gotten down all the it, way down? It, it isn't a particularly high priority for us. <laughs> uh, Pinky but tracking is not on the list? <laughs> uh, no, unfortunately. I think that's A-OK. -okay. Uh, but we've been showing those off with Toybox, which is our internal test bed that we've been using over the last several years mm -hmm. to develop virtual reality input. And it's not really a game, but it's a multiplayer experience where uh, you can kind of uh, you can shoot laser guns with people. You can build blocks. You can play tetherball. Uh, I can teleport us between different worlds, kind of like in the the construct in the Matrix, where Morpheus is able to take Neo to different places. We can go to space, underwater, back to a blank white room. Uh, it's it's a pretty cool demo. It's interesting to hear you uh, talk about multiplayer because I think when a lot of people see a VR helmet, they see it as an isolating experience because you're not seeing what's around you. If someone's on the couch, th th that doesn't matter. But there are a lot, but gaming is inherently social in a lot of ways. And so, how sort of how does gaming's social aspect manifest itself when it comes to Oculus games? In a lot of ways, virtual reality can actually be the most social type of gaming that there possibly is. What's more social than being able to take a person and make them feel like they're in a place with another person without actually having to be in that place? I mean, that, you know, there's a lot of local multiplayer games that work well because online multiplayer, you're basically limited to disembodied voice chat, you know, floating from your friend's head. Yeah. Actually hanging out together is a lot cooler. And so virtual reality is the only tech that can make you really feel like you're in a virtual world with someone else. And if you look at the history of virtual reality, uh, especially virtual reality science fiction, things like Snow Crash or Ready Player One, mm -hmm. they don't depict virtual reality as isolating at all. Science fiction has known for decades that VR is not an isolating technology. You don't read sci-fi books about gamers sitting alone in their room playing VR games. It's no, about people not. being in digital worlds that exist alongside, parallel to the real world, and communicating en masse, whether it's playing games, doing work, education. Uh, those are the types of things that have always defined virtual reality. And we're just mm -hmm. starting to get to the technology to the point where we can actually make it happen. We can make a virtual social network, if you will. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the concept of a social network as it exists today, I don't think is going to translate directly over to virtual reality. It's not obvious that that's the best way to do things. It might be good for a mobile phone or for a desktop PC or a laptop, but when you're in virtual reality, there's so many more things that you can do. And in a way, social gaming has turned into a bit of a dirty word. Like, social gaming means shitty gaming. Mm -hmm. And social features means useless features. But being in a virtual world with people is social gaming. Like, it's almost the definition of it. And I think that it's going to really inspire people to do a lot of incredible things. We're already seeing that from our developers. And yeah, you make great references to literature that has certainly envisioned that for years. I'd be interesting to see the uh, Oculus reading list of sort of stuff that has inspired uh, the design processes and the kind of it's systems, a long list. You're, yeah, systems you're imagining uh, for Oculus. Now, I think one of the things at E3 that we've seen is, you know, e the, the Oculus, other VR is on display, but the big consumer push feels like it's maybe coming next year. You know, certainly with you guys coming to market in the spring, uh, and other release dates not really announced for other uh, competing hardware. I think 
the question on a lot of people's I think so, minds. Sony said first half of next year, right? First half of next year. Yeah, as well? I, th I think that's what they. I think that's what Sony's pushing for. It's going to be a busy first half then. Uh, it is. I think one of the questions on everyone's mind is. VR word of mouth is very powerful, but how do you convey the VR experience? How do you sort of sell someone on VR who can't necessarily put the helmet on themselves, who maybe doesn't have the opportunity? The only way is for them to try. Right? It's you, the only way. You can attempt to depict it. And yeah. some people who are familiar with the eye, I mean, we, we kind of have this advantage. Other technology has to, like wearable watch, like wearables, for example, whether mm -hmm. it's fitness bands or watches, they have to convince people that this is something they care about. Virtual reality has the advantage of having lots of sci-fi, and so a lot of people have seen The Matrix, and you're like, this is, l it's like The Matrix, kind of. And they're like, oh, I understand that. I get it. And they can imagine it. Uh -huh. But a lot of people, especially, you know, that haven't seen movies like that or who don't care about those, they need to be convinced that VR is something they care about. And that's why we're here with a huge booth. Like, our booths get bigger and bigger, not because uh, of vanity. It's because we have to show them to as many people as possible. More and more people, yeah. Yeah, and that's why we go to a ton of shows, to show as many people as possible. Once virtual reality is shipping to people, they'll be able to show their friends. I think that's going to drive a lot of adoption when I can show you know, my 10 friends, my f less than 10 friends, <laughs> uh, what, what virtual reality is like. They can get excited about it. And we're also pushing to try a VR in retail so that people who uh, don't have any friends can also go and check out virtual reality mm -hmm. and see what it's like. And some people are going to want it right away. Some people are going to say, too expensive, the quality's not where I want to be, but that's okay. Sure. Because at the very least, once you try VR, you n understand the idea well enough that most people know that there is some point where it will get cheap enough, small enough, comfortable enough, full of content enough that they are going to want it. If it's not today, not next year, maybe the year after that, maybe it's 10 years from now. But the but end goal is coming. to convince everybody. Yeah, and I think one of the really interesting things, you know, obviously E3 is a gaming stage, and there's a lot of wonderful gaming potential in VR. But, uh, you know, when you guys talk about VR, you talk about presence. And I think people who are, are outside of gaming, you know, the ability to just put this on and feel presence in a forest somewhere, on the top of a mountain, any, any landscape that a designer can imagine, I think that's one of the most powerful things that VR can do. Do you, when you guys are designing it, you know, obviously sort of, you, you're tackling the challenges of gaming. Are you also trying to, to uh, envision those applications for people who just would want a different kind of experience, that kind of presence somewhere they couldn't even imagine? Definitely. I mean, there's two sides of it. There's, there's kind of that recreational side that you're talking about where it's, I just want to be a place that I'm not, and that's novel on its own. Um, but right now, the games industry is dominating VR because it's the only industry that's equipped with the tools and the talent to make immersive real-time 3D worlds. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're, and gamers are really the only people who are investing in the hardware that it takes to have really cutting edge experiences. Uh -huh. That's gonna change over time. Uh, as you start to see VR go up to more people, you're gonna have things like education, being able to take people to learn about things that they couldn't possibly, whether it's seeing the body on a much smaller scale than is possible in real life, or taking a field trip to some place that either doesn't exist anymore or you can't afford to travel to. Uh, elderly who are frail and trapped in nursing homes will be able to go places, whether they're real places or virtual places, and escape from where they are using virtual reality. And don't even get me started on business telepresence. It sounds boring, but you're here and I'm here because We've decided that there's some value in all of us traveling to this convention center, burning millions of gallons of fuel yep. uh, and countless dollars so that we can sit together on this stage. Eventually, if you're going to be able to do that in VR, that is a really positive thing. To be able to bring people from the other side of the world at no cost, at no resource cost, that, that's going to be something that's really huge. It's pretty incredible, Palmer. And I think your wardrobe choice today is fitting because hearing you talk about VR and imagining just the sheer breadth of ways that it can change so many different sectors of our society kind of feels like looking up at a field of stars where it just is bigger and bigger the more you look at it. It's true. And, and like to touch on another thing is uh, digital communication in general is pretty flawed right now. Like we use Skype, we use cell phones, we use text messaging, but they're all broken abstract forms of communication that we've invented around the limitations of technology, not what we actually want to do. And so you know, I, I feel like that's also driving a lot of you know, it's hard to get like sarcasm across in a text, for example. <laughs> yes. um, it's also really easy to be extremely aggressive towards someone when all you're doing is writing an email I'm to just them. trying to communicate a fact to you. I didn't, yeah. I didn't mean it. And in a yeah. way, virtual reality is a, it has the potential to be the most human form of digital communication yet because it can make you feel like you're in a place with another person, interacting with them in the same way that you would interact with a person in the real world. That's going to change gaming. That's going to change entertainment. That's going to change a lot of practical things, too.
amazing technology with amazing potential. Palmer, thank you so much for coming on the stage. Thank you for and having me. Much appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, the future is coming. It's going to be pretty fantastic. We'll be back live with more GameSpot coverage of E3.